Well, welcome to the second in our discussions around the Asia News Network of the current crisis, the COVID-19 coronavirus that is affecting all of us in this region, of course, uh, all around the world. With me today, I have Syed Nazakat. Syed's an old friend, editor of the Asia News Network's Delhi office. Um, Minthor Hutt, and I'm not sure if I'm saying your name right, I'm sorry about that, executive director of the 11 Media Group in Yangon, Myanmar. Welcome. Uh, it's going to be very interesting to hear your point of view from what's going on there. Van Tran, news editor from Vietnam News. Uh, in Hanoi, Vietnam. Welcome, Van. And of course, Panna, who's the executive director of the Asia News Network in Bangkok, uh, Thailand. But, but Panna, we've already talked about Thailand in the last discussion, so I believe that you're going to be talking about Japan and South Korea. Let's, yes. let's get straight into it. So I want to go um, around you one by one, just maybe to give you a, a quick introduction. And a very quick briefing on where you're at in your country at this particular point in time in regards to the COVID-19. Syed, could we start with you? Thank you so much, really, DJ, joining this call in, in the morning. I think uh, we are going through an unprecedented situation in India. This is the world's largest lockdown. And uh, since last, I think now, like almost uh, two weeks now, uh, it's really unprecedented situation. We've never seen a situation like this. And uh, but luckily so far, I think we are still better compared to a lot of other countries. The infection rate so far, if we have the correct numbers with me till morning, is around like still 5,300 people infected with the disease with 150 deaths actually. So we, when you compare these numbers with what's happening in other countries, you feel like we are still much, much better. But I think the India's biggest test will be next week when the lockdown will end, when the 21-day uh, long lockdown will end, what will the government do after that? Will they lift the lockdown and allow people to come on road because we're still in the middle of outbreak? And will they kind of expand this lockdown for one more week or two more weeks? Because this is, a, India is a developing country. We have millions of millions of daily wage workers who earn their living by doing daily jobs. And they are going through a really tough phase. We have already seen the visuals and images of uh, millions of migrant workers moving from cities from uh, to the village back to the villages when the lockdown was imposed two weeks back. So it is a tough situation for everyone, for the government. And I, I think all we are hoping right now is that somehow we're able to defeat and lower down the curve of the infection rate. If we are able to do that for one more week, two more weeks, I think we're going to save a lot of lives here. And um, let's move over to Vietnam. Van Tran in Hanoi and in fact across Vietnam. How are things with you at the moment? Well, as of 6 a.m. this morning, uh, we have the two new cases of the COVID-19, which brings the total number of the Vietnam uh, infected cases to uh, 251 cases, uh, which is, I think, a relatively low number compared to other countries. Um, and we have also 122 people have been, been recovered from the disease and we're expecting to have more today. Um, the most important thing is that up to date, Vietnam has recorded no fatalities from the pandemic. Um, I think that's a quite uh, increasing number for Vietnam. Also, we are having uh, 85,000 people being quarantined or isolated at healthcare centers or at other establishments. Um, from uh, March 31st, I, I think the government has uh, announced um, a requirement for nation, national scale social distancing starting from April 1 to um, April 15. It's not like uh, a total lockdown or a curfew like in some other countries, but people have been told to stay inside and just go out for food, medicine and other essential stuff. Um, but one thing is that uh, for the biggest uh, hotspot of Vietnam right now is the Bạch Mai Hospital, where just a cluster of new infection has just been uh, discovered. Uh, authorities said that they have not been um, able to track the, the source of the transmission yet. And so there is now fears of transmission among the, commu uh, among the community. And that is uh, what worries us right now. And Min, in, uh, in Myanmar, you have fairly low numbers at the moment. You've managed to stave it off. Do you think that this is just the beginning of something that's going to be much bigger? Or do you think that you've acted soon enough or early enough, should I say, 
uh, to stave off what could be something a lot worse? Um, currently, as of today, we have 22 confirmed cases in Myanmar. One has passed away due to a combination of cancer and COVID-19. Our first confirmed case was two weeks ago, about the same time as Lao. A majority of these cases are people who return from foreign countries such as the US and the UK, and not, not as many confirmed local transmissions. But we know that this is a very long road ahead. So we have, we have done, done a couple of measures such as closing our borders, uh, uh, close, shutting off all incoming flights, and foreign returnees have been placed under very strict facility quarantine, which has been extremely effective. However, this is, and we believe that an outbreak, outbreak could come soon if urgent action is not taken. And our healthcare system does not have the resources or the personnel to handle this outbreak if it happens. Uh, although some stay-at-home orders have been have been implemented, uh, will be implemented during our Tianjin holidays, which is like a, a New Year festival. This will only last for 10 to 15 days, but we haven't, we haven't implemented a stay-at-home order like India, for instance. Okay, and Panna, we, you're going to be speaking about uh, South Korea and Japan, two very different scenarios there. We know um, from the States, I mean, a lot of people and in Europe have been talking about the South Korea model, uh, the, 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 uh, the numbers of tests that they've done, the way that they've really come at it very strong, although they have had quite large numbers. I think if I'm looking over here, a total case, cases of more than uh, 10,000. Japan, on the other hand, um, was very slow to react. It has reacted quite recently, I believe. Um, but up until that point, uh, really life has went on as normal and they just sort of tried to, to hope that it would go away. Obviously, it hasn't. And there's lots of uh, worries that it could become um, quite a problem there in the coming few weeks. What's your take on it, Panna? Yes. Uh, so for South Korea, South Korea has uh, received a lot of praise for, for its strategy and it, it, sticks, it, it, it sticks to what it, it, it knows. You, you, you might be surprised that initially they did not close down the country, they kept the air services going and then the people were curious why this is so. Basically, Korea, which now has 10,000 cases, about 200 deaths, has a recovery rate of almost 7,000, uh, so basically uh, se almost 70% recovery rate. Uh, the, the Korea case is a cluster case. You know, remember the, 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 the church uh, that, that held the, um, uh, the services uh, and then tried to hide the uh, infections, uh, the information, who they were. Uh, the, the Korea basically that's the cluster strategy, is to, to not to close the country down. Uh, and then they were also very upset that uh, the other countries uh, sort of isolated them, but basically they uh, remains open. And then they deal with the uh, cluster cases. Uh, they have tested, I believe, uh, around 500,000 uh, tests so far. So that the efficiency in, in management in the, uh, of the infection uh, uh, is now seem to be now on the containing trend and on the downward. Uh, this morning they uh, only um, reported just 50 new cases, you know, compared to several hundred maybe a week ago. Uh, Japan also is another uh, interesting case, uh, which which. You will correctly say there was some delay time lag. Uh, uh, remember the, the Diamond Princess cruise that came in, uh, that was uh, the first, uh, you know, the big case of, uh, that Japan has to deal with. Remember Japan is used to deal with emergencies. You know, they have uh, lots of uh, earthquake, they have uh, uh, Fushijama uh, nuclear plant, and, and, but, but these are physical things. You know, the pandemic is, 
is somewhat different in management of, of the, the operation. Uh, if you recall that uh, with the, 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 the Diamond Princess cruise, uh, 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 the, there was an uh, expert, a uh, health expert who went on board uh, and then did understand why the, the passengers were not you know, properly isolated. So he raised the alarm and then uh, all went quiet. And then uh, there was explosion of infection in Hokkaido. Hokkaido is a major uh, tourism hub, and that's where, where, where it all started. And now uh, it, it come to the stage where Japan now declare emergencies. Uh, among them is uh, part of uh, Osaka and, uh, and Tokyo, and whole, whole of Tokyo. Uh, but Japan is hampered in, in, in somewhat in the legal sense because uh, it still operates under the World War II uh, you know, conditions of, of, of managing uh, you know, draconian um, measure. They cannot do that. So basically their emergency is, is, is uh, there's no punishment. You know, the, the governor or the, the prime minister or the government can order people to do this and that. You know, to keep distance and so on, but they have, uh, they cannot punish, they cannot, uh, uh, you know, um, deal with the, the violations. But, uh, you know, as you know, you know the Japanese are, are very obedient, <laughs> very uh, communal uh, type of society. So, so hopefully they, you know, they will get, get through the, this. But they are now, now the rising curve. They are now, they, are, they have now 4,400 uh, cases. Um, Syed, in, in India, uh, I've I noticed that your testing rate is quite low compared to the rest of the world. Um, you've talked about this very strict lockdown. I'm kind of wondering how you feel India is dealing with this in compared, say, to China, another country that's been through it slightly earlier than you, similar in, in, in size uh, and density of populations. Um, do you think that, that you learned from China? I mean, you, you've been very strict in, in, that, in the same regard the way China was in, in locking people down, but your testing has not been, uh, I would say, it, it, it's not been uh, on the same sort of scale. Is that just down to logistics, or do you think that, that they didn't really feel the need for it, given the fact that you put the lockdown in place fairly early on? Yeah, I, th I think there are a couple of things, to be honest, and let, let's be fair with the situation. Uh, we had our first case, I think, on the 30th of January, when three stu students from the Wuhan came from uh, China and reached Kerala, the southern state of India. And that was our first, uh, you can say, zero patient, those three students. And then slowly the virus started, uh, the disease started, uh, you know, like spreading to other areas. But somehow we thought, like, this is a disease which is just going to affect China. We never thought, of, like, it's going to affect us till we reached mid-Feb or last week of Feb. And then we realized we have a, a group of Italian tourists who are in Delhi and all of them, 16 or 14 of them were all infected. And suddenly we started having cases from other parts of the country, including Mumbai now, which is a commercial state, has one of the highest numbers in the country right now. And what happened uh, in, in all these uh, two months was essentially first there was a little bit uh, laziness on behalf of government to react. But then suddenly when they found the situation is going completely out of hand, may go out of hand, they just gave uh, a kind of a, a no no chance for people to move, and there was a very strict lockdown, which is uh, going underway till 14th of uh, 14th of uh, this uh, this month. Testing, I think, certainly that's a, one of the, the key concerns of everyone that we are not really testing enough people, and the reason for essentially for that is we don't have capital. We are a one billion people population country. We don't really have the facilities to test so many people. So what the government right now is trying to do is that. Just try, they're trying to isolate people and who they believe are going to are uh, infected and test them and remove them from the others. Because the, the, the concern is if they start testing everyone, they don't have the infrastructure. They don't because then people will land up in hospitals and we don't have hospitals to accommodate so many people actually. So that is like a game we are right now playing. That's why the lockdown was actually for quite a bit long. So they let people stay back at home. So we don't need to test more people. But I think, I think the challenge for us in the next two weeks will be once we remove the lockdown, if the government decided to remove the lockdown on, on the 14th, 
how will the situation emerge or will they keep lockdown continue because there are repercussions there are massive financial repercussions of this lockdown i think that's for india is a really disturbing situation because our economy was already struggling and now we have put it under a situation because of this whole concern is going to be almost really really uh, you can say a serious economic consequences of this of this whole thing but the the final decision is that let's save people and then we will take care of economy later let's not think of economy at the moment so that's the the situation we are we are currently in uh, yeah. can i step in just just to sure. ask a quick question uh, the message just from prime minister modi so it is more psychological rather than operational is that is that yeah. clear yeah. I, I think i think to some to, to some extent yes that uh, he knows that uh, certainly we are a huge country even keeping people inside home is not going to be like a putting army everywhere so he's, he's again again requesting through his different uh, video calls or his uh, weekly uh, te telephonic, uh, sorry, the radio addresses to the nation that I know you're suffering. I know everybody is suffering. I, I stand with you, but let's just stay home. And then let, I think that's that's having some impact, to be honest. He, he, he asked people to light the lamps on the weekend. And that really a little bit worked for some people to like, okay, let's, let's all stay cool and calm for one more week, two more weeks till we come back. But I think in operational level, we're str struggling. We are really struggling, you know, you know, in terms of testing people, in terms of isolating, in terms of providing equipment to doctors. Now, one hospital in Mumbai just last week was closed down because everyone in that hospital, 22 nurses and doctors got infected because they were not having basic equipment to protect themselves. So that, that situation is certainly there. Operational level, we're really struggling on number of fronts. But I think the overall, I think the impact is going to be is like everybody somehow agrees that let's defeat this curve in next one or two weeks. If we manage to do that, then we're OK. Because if something goes wrong here, we are the world's second most populous country and with a huge density. If something goes wrong here, then it's almost impossible to stop the virus from spreading. And Van, in, in, in Vietnam, we heard uh, on the first episode of this discussion from Joe Lee uh, talking about China having this, this 4 plus 4 plan that was in place before the virus struck. And it was basically just a case of, of somebody in the government saying, OK, let's hit the button, let's go with, with our policy. Is that something that was in place also in Vietnam? I mean, you've, you've had, as you said, zero deaths. Uh, you've kept your rates fairly low. Was there, was there preparation for this uh, uh, leading up to, the, uh, to, to you actually doing the same sort of thing? Did you have a plan in place? The Vietnam government has acted very quickly, even before uh, the uh, pandemic uh, spread to Vietnam, uh, because we know that we have limited resources. And unlike other wealthier countries, Vietnam is not in the position to conduct mass testing like South Korea. So I think that it is fo focusing on more on measures that are within its control that are more affordable uh, for the country. For example, uh, when the first cases was reported in Vietnam back in January, um, Vietnam uh, quickly stopped all flights from and to China uh, and decided to close schools after the Tet holiday and uh, for a very unprecedented, uh, unprecedented move, it locked out a whole commune in Sơn Loi uh, in Vinh Phuc province where migrants worker returned from Wuhan, China where um, they had infected with the virus. Um, and I think that it, it, it has been working because for a whole 20 days, Vietnam has no uh, new cases. But then when we come to the second phase, uh, when the 16 um, uh, infected uh, uh, cases were found, um, the government also acted very quickly and it suspended all international flights, it shut down schools, and it Quarantine all uh, coming, uh, all flights coming from Vietnam. All passengers coming to Vietnam are required to follow a mandatory 14 quarantine. Um, and um, the government has also decided to isolate all infected people and try to track down all contacts that had that they have been uh, contacted with. And I, I think that um, uh, it is working uh, because. Uh, Apart from the back my hospital case where we are unable to track down the transmission, before that we, we have been able to track down all the contacts that have been uh, in contact with the infected cases. And um, 
I think that the national uh, scale uh, social distancing uh, does not only require people to stay in, but it also asks uh, non-essential business and firms uh, to reduce their operation and um, uh, to reduce uh, the business so that um, uh, we can we can we can better the virus. Um, we can see that now in the street, public transportation is also limited. Um, for the case in like my, I think that uh, a huge effort has been put because uh, that's that's one of the biggest hospital in Vietnam with thousands of visitors every day, and but within only one week. 52,000 52, people who have either come there to work or to visit or for health checkup have been tracked, identified, and uh, put under monitor. So I think that Vietnam has uh, been acting very swiftly and strictly regarding this. And for you, Min, in Myanmar, uh, how, how is this affecting your economy? Your your sort of very quickly growing economy at the moment. Um, sort of lots of new ventures, lots of things happening there. Um, is this going to be a long term effect? Do you think? Uh, at the moment, we do not have an outbreak. At the moment, we only have twenty two positive cases. However, we have a very low number of testing, approximately a total of a thousand total tests, or around fifty to eighty tests per day. And there could have been many mild symptoms that were undetected, but there hasn't been an outbreak of citizens who have displayed pneumonia, like serious symptoms. And despite the low number of testing there, I don't believe there is a big difference between the actual figures and the figures reported by the government. People experiencing pneumonia like symptoms have been hospitalized in huge, haven't been hospitalized in huge numbers. But although we have it this fairly under control, if there is a huge outbreak of in and our hospitals do not have the resources or the medical personnel to handle an outbreak. The potential is highest in our biggest cities of Yangon and Mandalay. Unlike other countries, we cannot sustain long periods of lockdown because our economy is not as robust and thriving as our neighboring countries. We are a developing country with high rates of poverty. We have daily workers who must, who must work or they, they will not earn a daily wage to feed their families. These people cannot merely be told to just stay home. My main worry for COVID-19 is that it will exacerbate our long-term poverty and hunger. We are going to be hit harder than our neighboring co countries because we are the poorest countries, country in the region. And this will, and it will, this will utterly destroy and collapse our socio-economic life. The World Bank predicts that our economy will slow to a 2 to 3% growth this year from a projection of 6 to 7%. But I believe this could be much worse. There are four factors Four factors that will affect, strongly affect our economy. That, that is, the first one is the disruption and unemployment from, unemployment from the garment industry due to the, due to the breakdown of the supply chain, especially due to the large outbreak in the European Union. The second is the breakdown of the remittance from the migrant workers due to the unemployment in the Middle East. The third reason is the destruction of our S uh, small and medium industry uh, enterprises, and the last one is the collapse of our tourism industry. There has only been an economic stimulus of 70 million U.S. dollars to help these industries, which hasn't been enough to boost our industries and revive our economy. This is a this is a low number compared to our neighboring countries. Okay, we've only got a few minutes left. I realize I haven't got two panel on that question, but I want to do a quick roundup, um, maybe starting with you, Panna, of what are your predictions for the future? When is this pandemic going to finish? Um, and what will be the long-term effects? We've just had a little bit from, um, from Myanmar on that, on, on your countries. Yeah. Panna, can I start with you? Yes. Uh let, let me give you a take on the, the, the signal from different countries across Asia so that you have a perspective. 
many of the leaders are now uh, trying to stay ahead of the curve you know, for, for, for obvious reason. Uh, Vietnam, for example, the prime minister is now talking about preventing in the second wave. The second wave hasn't started, but he's already uh, 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 moving uh, in that direction. Uh, Japan has now come out of the, um, you know, the, 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 the dilemma of, of the Olympics and health. Now the prime minister is now concentrating totally on health. Uh, you have uh, Indonesia, you have Pakistan, uh, the leaders that are struggling, struggling to deal with the operation. You can see that in their tones. Uh, but you can see the Prime, Prime Minister of Bangladesh, very firm now, uh, that uh, April is a crucial month, even though their, their figure is still quite low. Uh, Prime Minister Modi in India staying, trying to stay ahead of the curve with all the difficulties, uh, trying to give encouragement uh, you know, for, for, for the Indian people to, to fight this. Uh, you see in, in Singapore, despite all the, uh, 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 the right words from, from the government, from the prime minister, the, uh, um, they still have cluster of cases. So Singapore, is, it, it become more restrictive. Uh, in um, uh, uh, Philippines, uh, the, the government also struggling. You know, they closed down uh, Luzon. Luzon is a the largest island uh, in the Philippines with 50 million people. They're struggling in, in all times. And, and, and the, the leadership at this time uh, are crucial if you want to go through this uh, uh, phase. Uh, April is a crucial phase for, for Asia. Uh, I think all of us expect that in May things will start uh, to get better. That this is, this is uh, my take across Asia at the moment. Okay, and Syed, um, what's your take from India? Uh, I think uh, given the earlier outbreaks uh, like H1N1 earlier in India, I think this disease is going to be here for some time for sure. And there is al already a chance and already a fear that it may come back again in, in terms of second wave. So uh, what we have to do and learn actually, the governments have to do and learn is essentially how to allow the normal life and at the same time keep fighting the disease because you can't do the lockdown forever. So somehow there has to be a way out where the normal life can somehow return to some level of normalcy. And at the same time, there are proper measures. That means essentially testing more people, isolating more people, and making sure there are facilities to treat these people. If we learn that, then the normal life can kind of come back on a track, and then the people will start going back to their work and attending their day-to-day -day work. I think that is a really the challenge the governments have to, you know, uh, actually to, to take and decide how they're going to do that. Because lockdown for a long time is certainly a kind of a financial suicide. And, and Van, in, in Vietnam, what's your, your take? The pandemic surely remains at a dangerous level for quite some time more, especially when we know that there are community transmission in the Vietnam um, community now, and things might get more complicated tomorrow or the next day and we, we might have more even higher cases not just like the past few days but i think that um because since the for the past few days we have a very low number of new cases that vietnam has the right amount of time to be prepared uh for the worst scenario in in case it should happen uh, as far as i know that the ministry of health uh, announced that they have now prepared adequate facilities and equipment for the situation of if we have 10,000 of cases of COVID-19 in Vietnam. And um, the, the military and uh, other ministries said that they have also been prepared for scenarios when we have uh, 10,000, 20,000, and 30,000 cases of COVID-19. Of course, I know it, it's easier said than done, but uh, at least I know that the government and every ministry and sectors have been prepared for this. Um, I think that uh, the private companies and, and, and other establishment in the Vietnam has also been supporting this by producing more um, machine, um, medical masks, medical suits and uh, ventilators. Um, also, um, the financial effect is also one of the most concerned of the government, just as in any other country. And the government has announced that they have uh, they are preparing for packages, which is to deal with uh, 
uh, the pandemic, they have two uh, separate kind of stimulus package. One is for the poor, who is the most uh, serious uh, affected by the pandemic, because we know Vietnam has also has a lot of uh, street vendors and small business, and now we, they all have to close. Um, that uh, package would be like 2.7 billion US dollar, and the government has another six billion uh, dollars package to support uh, the business which is aff affected by the pandemic. So I think that uh, the government is one side, but also we we having a lot of support from the soldiers, the people. Because for the past few days, we have seen the pictures of many soldiers who have given up their places, their rooms, their blankets for the people who who have to come for quarantine. Uh, the soldiers who patrolling days and night at borders to help uh, fight with the pandemic. And we have a lot of individuals and groups uh, coming to get donations from people from organizations to help the poor who have who have not been able to make admit during such a crisis time. So I hope, I highly hope that uh, uh, with such preparation, Vietnam will stand strong, um, even though that we don't, do not know what might come tomorrow. Okay. I mean, we're, we're, we're very short on time now. In fact, we've gone over time. So just a very quick summary from you. When is this going to end in Myanmar? I don't believe that the crisis will end anytime soon uh, throughout the world and in Myanmar because as long as a vaccine or a proper cure hasn't been found, because this disease is serious, it is extremely infectious, and the economic effects will last way into 2021. In Myanmar, I fear that it will get hit harder than our neighboring countries, which, have, which are more developed than us. Essentially, and most importantly, let me urge China and our neighboring ASEAN countries that although an outbreak hasn't happened in our country, we urgently need your help to mitigate and control an outbreak or large swaths of the population getting infected because our healthcare system at its current capacity cannot handle these major increases in COVID cases. We need a lot of medical consultation, medical doctors, equipment such as PPE, face masks, ventilators to handle COVID-19. Forceful and urgent action must be taken now to mitigate the already disastrous effects on our economy and most importantly, to prevent large numbers of people from dying and getting infected. Okay, thank you very much. I know you're all very busy. Um, for spending time to discuss this. This is the second, as I said, in a series of discussions from the Asia News Network editors. The Asia News Network is a group of media organizations, a network of, of media organizations around Asia. My name's DJ Clark. I'm talking to you from the China Daily offices in Hong Kong. Um, and that's it for this episode. Thank you very much for joining us.